So let's hear what the Torah has to say. Just to amend that slightly, even uh, I'm not here, uh, I'm not here uh, to give you definitive law. We're here just to discuss uh, the concepts with which, as we'll see, many of the concepts uh, great scholars have argued about. We just try to define what are the concepts that would be involved in making this uh, decision. So there, there are two parts. There are two parts uh, to the question. The first part relates to, uh, let's call it the retailer. Person has a store, Walmart, local store, local hardware store in the south. Is he permitted, the Jewish store owner, is he permitted to carry and sell guns to the public? Now those guns can be of two varieties. They could be regular handguns, or they could be assault weapons. Assault weapons being weapons that normally would be sold, let's say, for the military. And they don't have any greater protection than having a regular handgun unless, you know, if you're being attacked by 30 terrorists in your house, it's not going to make a difference whether you have that assault gun or you have a regular gun, you're dead. So in the normal situation. So there, there, there are two... Uh, so the, que the first question is, can the retailer sell the weapons? It may depend who he's selling them to. We'll see in a minute. The second fundamental question is are you allowed to have in your house a, a gun? So that's the second question. The two are tied in. Because if a person is not allowed to have a gun, then the concept of Lifnei Iver, as we'll see, would say that I'm not allowed to sell them a gun. Because I don't have the gun, I'm just selling them the gun. To me it's a business. But if the person I'm selling the gun to, under the, under the Torah's laws, is not allowed to have a gun in his house, I'm not allowed to sell it to him. So I wanted to briefly, and then there's the final question, the, the argument on the other side, which is what if you have the gun for protection? And as we'll see, the Gemara in a number of places actually discusses that specific question. Is the fact that someone argues, I need a gun for protection. If you're living on the 30th floor on Lexington Avenue, that's a, with a doorman, it's a pretty weak argument that you need that assault weapon for protection. If you're living in North Dakota, you know, 50 miles from the closest town, then that, that may be a valid argument. So let, first I'd like to go through Lifnaiver, and then we'll go through, are you allowed to have the weapon? What does Lifnaiver mean? I'm going to explain. <laughs> and, then, and then we'll tie the two concepts together and see some of the fundamental questions that you know, the great authorities talk about. Lifneiver means putting a stumbling block, literally putting a stumbling block in front of a blind person. As I mentioned before, there are three aspects to Lifneiver. The first aspect is the literal aspect. See a blind man walking in the street, and you put something on the floor which is going to cause him to stumble. So the truth is that many authorities, uh, many, many uh, interpreters, of the Torah say that the Torah was never even talking about that case. Uh, some say Rashi in different places in the Talmud says yes. It surely means the literal interpretation. Don't put a stumbling block in front of a person. You know now you put it. You're, now when you put that stumbling block down, you are creating a hazard for him. So there, the the lifnaiver is similar to what we're going to be talking about, where you're creating a physical hazard to this blind person. Okay, so we'll come back to that. In the, in, in the, the main interpretation of Lifnaiver is the one that the, uh, in, in the handout, is the one that the Rambam has in, in Sefer HaMitzvahs. And, and that, that is, that's number seven. When someone asks you for advice regarding something he's not expert in, this mitzvah prohibits misleading or deceiving him. Rather, you should guide him towards the choice you think is proper. And then at the end of 7, again, the Rambam says, Maimonides, the simple meaning of the verse, however, is as mentioned above, giving misleading advice. So the Torah is telling you that the concept of caveat poor does not apply. You know, you can't say buyer beware. You can't give people advice that leads them to do things which you know will be financially or physically injuri you know, injurious to their financial or physical health. You know, we have a concept in Judaism of uh, kol Yisrael Zel 
every Jew is responsible for the, for the health and welfare and being of every other Jew. So clearly if I'm responsible, if every Jew is my brother, I surely should not be giving him advice, which uh, either spitefully or for my own benefit, you know, I'm telling him something uh, w which I know is bad advice for him. That's not the, pri that's not the primary lifnaiver that we're going to talk about. We're talking about the third lifnaiver. The third, not the physically putting the stumbling block in front of the blind man, not giving someone advice in business or in life that you know is bad advice for them, but the third one, which is the Rambam says, this prohibition includes one who assists or causes another to com com commit a transgression. In other words, the cases, we're going to go through four or five cases very quickly, where you are causing someone else to sin. The snake caused Eve to sin. Now, the Rambam then goes on to explain, what does that have to do with putting a stumbling block in front of a blind person? After all, in a lot of these cases, the, the, in, in some, well, we'll see the different cases, but one of the cases the Gemara has is that I'm lending money to somebody, you know, at a usury, at, at usury, which is not allowed. So both the lender and the borrower are transgressing lifne either. Now, they're not blind, and they know they're paying the usury, so why is that lifne either? So the Rambam explains, and I've seen this myself in business many times, he says, because the person's vision is obstructed by his desire to sin, and he has become blind. When I want that loan to close that big deal, and the only way I can get the money is by, by paying usury, which I'm not allowed to pay. Obviously, there are cases where you can pay, pay interest. And there are many examples in the, in the Talmud that the Talmud clearly understood both the concept of, of the time value of money and interest, etc. But in a case where I can pay interest, you are so blinded by your desire to get that deal done, that you are in fact a blind person. Same as in the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, according to one interpretation of the Talmud, he went in to do the sin. Except then, you know, he, he saw the image of his father and said, I can't do this. So sin blinds you. It makes you misinterpret what it is you're seeing. Something that's really of minimum value, you can because of your desire to do it, it becomes the most wonderful thing in the world. Whether it's food you shouldn't eat or a relationship you shouldn't have. So Ram is saying that the person who has that desire to sin is in fact a blind person. So we have a number of examples to the extent to which you know, the Torah you know, goes in this question of not having someone sin. And there are, all, there are many, many aspects of this lay lif naiver. The first case, again, is the case of the snake and Eve, where the snake, for his, own, for his own reasons, you know, he wants Adam to die, and he tells Eve to give the apple to Adam so he, so he should die. And uh, th so there, if, if you look at the end of the first, the Ramban says that what this story is teaching us, teaches us many things, obviously. We're not here to, to discuss the whole story, but if you look at the end of one, says the Ramban, from here we can learn the applicability of punishment to those who cause other people to sin in any manner. Just as the sage has taught us, based on the verse, you do not place a stumbling block. If you look at the Torah, the first punishment is meted out to the snake. But the snake didn't eat from the tree. So what was the great sin that the snake did? His great sin was enticing and encouraging Adam and Eve to sin, even though, not even though, because he knew the consequences of what would come from that, and he gave them all sorts of reasons and rationales why this is the right thing. Not only is it not prohibited, this is something you should be doing. And that's with Naiver. In other words, you're taking what a rational person would look at and say, this is insane. God told me, don't eat it, because if I eat it, I'm going to die. And you're, you're twisting it, that if you eat it, you'll become like God, don't worry about it. And that's the classic example of lifneiver. That's encouraging someone, talking someone into doing a sin. 
The, the, now, the, there are other cases of Lif Naivir, as we said, in the case of lending and borrowing with usury, the lender wants to lend. The borrower wants to borrow. Neither one is tricking the other. So there it's not, there the Lif Naivir is that, but you can't, one person by himself can't do that sin. You can't lend to yourself at usurious rates. I need someone else to lend to me. The borrower can't borrow from himself. He needs someone else to borrow. So there the lift naive is though both are going into this. They know it's not allowed, but you can't have that avera or sin with one person in the singular. So each one is making by participating with the other. They're, 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 they're over on lift naive. The one of the most extreme cases, if you saw, if you saw, is the, is the Gemara Moikotin, that's number three, that a father should not hit his adult son, which most interpret to mean, it doesn't mean a 13-year-old, because we hit 13 years old. We're talking about an adult son, he's 18, he's 20, he's 22, and he did something which is ridiculously bad. And I think the right thing to do is to, is to, is to give him a smack. So the Gemara says, I can't give him a smack. Why? Because I have to anticipate, even though, let's say, I'm allowed to give him that smack. I'm not going to get into that question. Let's assume, Chanoch Lanar, you're, you're allowed to give him, and maybe you should give him that smack on the head, you know, to, 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 to get him back to reason. Because if I hit him, there's the fear that I would provoke him, and then he's going to hit his father. And that, that, that is a terrible sin. So I'm provoking him, I'm putting him into a situation which may lead him to, uh, to do a terrible sin. So I have to think ahead of time. Okay? I can't just whack him. I have to think, if I hit him, what is the consequence? And the consequence may be that he'll hit me back, and that's a terrible, that's a terrible uh, thing. And just to go over one or two more cases, and then we'll go on to the next concept, the, the Rambam says that if you're a mortgage broker and you, you brought the lender and the borrower together, now you're not doing the sin and they both want to do it, but you're facilitating each one of them in doing this sin. So again, that, that's a lift naive. The last case, which will be very relevant to our basic question, is the Gemara in, in Avodah which relates to someone who, who is a Nazir, which means that he has taken a vow not to cut his hair and not to drink wine. That's what a Nazir is. Can't drink wine, can't cut his hair, can't go into a cemetery. And the Nazir asks me, it's the Nazir's cup of wine, and he asks me, give me the cup of wine. So the Gemara there distinguishes as follows. If we're both sitting at the same conference table, and the Nazir says, pass me the cup of wine, you're definitely not over lif naive if you pass him the cup of wine. Why? Because if I don't pass him the cup of wine, he's going to reach out his hand and he's going to take the cup of wine. But let's say we're on two sides of a river. Okay? He can't get across the river. But I can take the wine and put it on a pole and get it on the other side. So here the Gemara says, then I'm not allowed to do it. So if he doesn't need me to do it, then there's... Uh, then, then there's no lif naive. He knows it's wine. He knows he's not allowed to drink the wine. He can reach over and get that wine. So when he asks me to give it to him, I'm not definitely not over lif naive. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I have a question. I was uh, I was at the movie theater once, and I had a cousin of mine next to me. Yes. And and I had a, a coworker to the left of me, both both Jews. Yes. And uh, my cousin, not religious, my cousin had popcorn, and the other person said, does he have any popcorn left? So I said no, because I thought it was not kosher, So I, because I thought that you're not allowed to feed non-kosher food, like be a... Uh, well, again... So I, is, that, is this... No, but is you this, see... The, the, this a bizarre view from uh, that? The, the, the Nuzer case is different. The case that I created, the wine belongs to the Nuzer. You're talking about, am I, that's a separate question which, which has many, it's, it's not for tonight's discussion, okay, okay. where you're asking somebody, you know, you're feeding him food that's not his, that's not kosher. Right. 
But that's uh, for a different discussion. Okay. We got we, we got to get to the guns. Okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> if we, we detour too much, we're not going to get to the guns. So, so that is the primary exception to lift naiva. The exception is if the person could do the avera on his own. He does not require, does not need me to do the avera. There is no lift naiva. Okay. There are a number of such examples in in the in the Talmud, and we'll see how that. That's really almost the fundamental. Uh, one of the fundamental questions we so have. So, in the case of the broker, if the another, mortgage broker, the, the, yeah, the broker. If so you're asking an excellent question. Okay, so this is a question that has been debated for many centuries. The question that was asked here is that if there's a the mortgage broker who puts a lender and a borrower together, we said is over Lifneiver. But there's a lot of Jewish mortgage brokers out there. <laughs> Too many, maybe. So why don't I say? That since he could get it from, uh, si since if I don't do the business, my neighbor is going to do the business, am I allowed? Okay. So this, the Mishnah Mel, who's one of the interpreters of the Rambam, he brings, a, he brings such, such an opinion that if someone else, someone th that I I here you have the Nazir on one side of the river, and there are two Jews, I and a fellow Jew are on this side of the river, and the Nazir says, uh, give me my wine, I want to drink it. So, one, so the, the Mishnah Lamela quotes a source that says that if the other Jew is willing to give him the wine, I can give him the wine. Because after all, the concept seems to be, I'm not facilitating it if he's going to get it anyway. Okay? And the Mishnah, that's, that's exactly your example. And the Mishnah Lamela says no. The fact that another Jew would do the Avera, would do does, the does, sin, doesn't, doesn't let, you do doesn't it. let me do it. Does not let me do it. On top of which, okay. if, you, it, um, if you let the other guy do it, you're making him be overlooked. You're overlooked well, it's a little circular, but again, that's, that's really so the that's question why. there. You could argue both, uh, you could argue both ways. You could argue, uh, you could argue that it's not lift naive for either because the other one is ready to do it, or it's, you're, causing it's a, yeah, you're causing him to do it. So does yes. that mean that if there's an Azur sitting across from me at the table, not only should I not pass him the wine, should I also hold it back, or just not? That, 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 that's, a, that, that's a separate question, which is also beyond our, uh, beyond our scope. You know, it, 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 that's, uh, if someone's doing a very what I should do. But uh, we, we, have to, we have to go on. One last case, which will be central. The, the Gemara in Avodah in, in the Dharma. The Gemara in the Durham has Ravashi. This is number four. Ravashi owned the forest. Okay, Ravashi was one of the great Talmudists. He owned the forest, which he sold to a fire temple. He sold them the wood from his forest. Said Ravina to Ravashi, but there is the assumption. Now, the assumption was that this fire temple, this is a temple that, that created fire. That was their method of worship to their pagan god. So you're giving them the means to worship their pagan god. So, said Ravina Travashi, do not put a stumbling block before the blind. Doesn't matter if it's a Jew who's going to be doing a sin, or, or it's a non-Jew who's also not supposed to worship a pagan god. So he replied, most wood is used for ordinary heating. In other words, most of the wood that the temple would buy was just it gets very cold. You know, in Babylonia in the winter, it's very cold. So you need the heat to keep it warm. So it is true that he may use some of that wood in his worship, but most of the wood he buys is not for that, and I don't have to worry uh, if some of that wood he, in fact, uses for his temple worship. We'll come back to that because that's a central uh, feature. So the bottom line is I have to think about actions that I do if they're encouraging they're provoking, just like the case I have here that from Maimonides. You can't buy, if you're walking on Fifth Avenue and someone is selling watches, now if you know it's a fake watch, it's a fake watch. He knows, you know, you're paying a small price. But if someone comes to you and you look at it and it turn, turn it over, and this is a Rolex, and it has the serial number, okay, and you know it's stolen, am I allowed to buy that watch? No, why not? I didn't steal it. So the answer the Rambam says is, because by buying from the robber, if no one would buy from a robber, 
It's not going to rob. He doesn't want a Rolex. He wants the cash. So by buying from the robber, I'm encouraging him to continue, uh, to continue doing what he shouldn't do. So th this is something that has universal application that I have to be careful that, A, don't give someone misleading advice and don't encourage, facilitate, participate, or anything with someone else in doing a sin. So that's, that's, let's put that on the side. The second question relates to, let's go directly to the question of the guns. Okay? The argument against having a gun in your house. Okay, there was an article in the Times just the other day on the op-ed page, you know, a list of all sorts of gun-related deaths. If you read it, uh, it was, I think, Monday. All sorts of gun-related deaths that, uh, that occurred last week. Uh, Joe Nocera's op-ed piece that, re that had to do with, it was a list throughout the United States of gun-related deaths last week. So a bunch of those gun-related deaths were little children who in their house picked up a gun and killed themselves, or killed somebody else. So a gun is something that can result in lethal injury. It can kill you. Now it's also possible that the child could go into the pantry and take out a knife and stab somebody. I have never heard of a, a child taking a knife and fatally either stabbing themselves or stabbing some, somebody else. But I'm sure there are hundreds of instances a year of somebody accidentally discharging a firearm. Now, of those of you who are Giants fans, which I'm not, unfortunately I'm a Jets fan, but if you are a Giants fan, you remember about four years ago, after the five years ago, after they won their first recent Super Bowl, that their star uh, receiver went to a nightclub and shot himself accidentally. Now, luckily for him, he ended up spending 18 months in jail, as Mayor Bloomberg insisted, now, he could have easily have killed himself. He could easily have killed somebody else. So a, a, a gun, assault or other type, is something that can very easily, and if you're a policeman, I think the law is, you know, you have a loaded weapon. Obviously, you have a loaded weapon. When you go home, you have to lock it up. You have to lock it up because you have to worry that someone, you know, would, would discharge that. So why, th so we know a gun will come back to the, to the issue of saying I can keep a gun because I need it for, to, to, for protection. We'll come back to that issue. But clearly if you have a gun, it can cause lethal, uh, you know, it, it can kill you or it can kill somebody else. So this concept, okay, that I can't have something which can result in lethal injury to somebody, we find two places in the Torah. Okay, if, if, you, if you look, the first place we have it in the Torah, well, I'll start with the second, because it'll be easier to understand. If you look at number, uh, number 14, it says in the Torah, when you build a new house, okay, this is assumed not today where we have pitched roofs, but in the old days, and even today you'll occasionally see a house, in the Middle East for sure, the houses have flat roofs. So if you build a new house, you shall make a guardrail, so it shall not cause blood to be spilled in your house, that the ones who falls should fall from it. So the Torah here is saying that if I build a house, okay, I can't say there's no business anybody being on my roof. I have to anticipate that there's going to be a repairman, there's going to be a child, even there's going to be somebody who shouldn't even be in my house. And he's going to go up on that roof. And if there is no guardrail and he falls off, he's going to kill himself. So the Torah is telling you that you have to prevent take preventive action to remove that situation. Uh, we know, I don't know how many years ago it was, but there were a number of cases of children falling out, unfortunately, from windows in New York, from high-rise windows in New York City, and I don't know exactly what the regulations are, but you're supposed to have gated windows, or a window that can't be opened. Because again, now, am I telling my wonderful little child to go to the window, stick his head out? But I remember as a kid, I used to stick my head out pretty far. Okay, I remember once when I was a kid, we were playing ball in front of RJJ, and the ball went on top of a roof, and I went up to the roof, and I leaned over, and it's lucky I'm here. So children do those crazy things, and adults do those crazy things all the time. So the Torah here is telling you, you build a house, you have to, you have to protect it. 
Now the Ramban says that this is the same concept as Leviticus 19.16, number 11, you shall not stand by the shedding of your fellow's blood. Now that concept says, if I see somebody drowning in a river, I have to jump in. Now a question which is also beyond our scope, if, if it's a raging river, you know, in Colorado, and he's drowning, and I jump in, and we had such cases a few years ago in New Jersey, uh, and in, in Muncie, uh, where Hatzola or other people actually died, because they went into the water to save somebody, and not only weren't they able to save them, they were also overcome. That's a separate question beyond it. But it, surely if it's no danger to my life, I'm absolutely obligated to do everything in my power to save somebody who is in mortal danger. So the Ramban says that that concept, and the concept of building the guardrail around your house on the roof, is the same concept. The logic is very simple. If, if, if I have to... If, if, if I have to avoid, in other words, if, if, I, if, if somebody's already in danger, okay, I have to do everything in my power to save him. So the Torah is extending that and saying, do everything you can so that the dangerous situation never arises. Okay? And let's put that guardrail you know, that, on, on the window or on the roof so you're not in a dangerous situation where you have to save somebody, God forbid. So those are the same concepts. I, I, cannot, I cannot create a dangerous situation, and if I see someone in a dangerous situation, I have to help them to the extent that I can to get them out of that. So this, coming to the gun case, so the Gemara has a number, the Talmud has a number of such cases. If you look at number 15, from where do we learn that a person should not raise a vicious dog? Now, we're not talking about Sparky or Spunky or whatever you want to <laughs> call that dog. We're talking about an a undomesticated pit bull. And again, a few years ago, there were a bunch of cases of pit bulls uh, killing people. So you have a pit bull. You should not have a pit bull. And it says, why? Be, and you should not have a rickety ladder in your house. Now, the rickety ladder, I know it's rickety. But someone, someone may be coming in if they ever show up to fix my cable and they get on that rickety ladder not knowing it's rickety and end of the cable guy. Okay, so I, I, have to be, I have to anticipate. And again, even if the person has no right whatsoever to be in my house, I can't say I'm going to have a house full of dangerous, lethal situations. It's not your business to walk into my house. Okay? I can't do that. I have to say maybe someone for some reason, you know, permitted or otherwise, will come into the, into the house. So you can't build a trap for intruders? Can't build a... A trap for intruders. Somebody where somebody will fall and say... No, uh, are you talking about a trap where they're going to die if they fall? I don't get majorly, get hurt. Get very hurt. Well, see, very again, that'll get us to the question of protection. L leave that, put that in abeyance. Okay, we'll get to that argument of protection. Now, that's a vicious dog. The Gemara later, if you look at number 17, goes actually uh, 16 and 17. Later in, 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 in Tractate Baba Kama, the Gemara says that I shouldn't have any dog unless he's chained. Now, I remember I was a little kid walking in Riverside Park with, uh, I think I was with a friend, we were going to play ball or something, and there was a man there with a dog that was not on a leash. And that dog started to chase me. And he just stood there smiling. I'm frightened out of my wits. <laughs> and he's standing there smiling at the whole situation. You know, and I'm not that scared of dogs. I mean, there are plenty of people in our extended family, they see a dog, they'll cross the street. You know, so this is saying I can't, even if it's a domestic, a vicious dog, you can never have, the Gemara says. Okay? It is a dog that can't be domesticated. But a regular dog, okay, there's still a danger, and the... The Talmud brings this example of the pregnant woman who walks into the house and, and, and the dog wasn't tied up and the dog barked at her and scared her and she miscarried. So you have to, you have to anticipate, and again, I'm not anti-dogs for the dog lovers here, but you have to be careful. You, clearly, I never, I see uh, in Brooklyn, the whole New York, everybody has dogs. The Russians in particular, I know, uh, they all have dogs. And I see people 
walking with two, three dogs, and they're not dog walkers. And I never understand, they're living in an apartment. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to go to sleep <laughs> if I had two or three dogs. And some of them are those, you know, those, uh, you ever see people walking in each hand, they're holding a pit bull. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, there's a free, again, this comes to issues of freedom. But on the other hand, the Gemara is saying, I can't, I have to be extraordinarily careful about a situation that, that can lead to someone being hurt or, or being, in fact, a lethal situation. I can't endanger, I can't do anything which will endanger somebody else. Now, the Rambam, if you look at the end of 21, not only can I not endanger somebody else, but the Rambam here is saying, Halochafai, our sages forbade many matters because they involve a threat to life. Whenever a person transgresses these guidelines, saying, I will risk my life. What does this matter to others? Okay? Or I am not careful about these things. He should be punished by stripes for rebelliousness. Which means that a person has no right. Just, you have no, just like you have no right to commit suicide. You have no right to go into situations which, which create mortal It's going to be a mortal danger. So that's the second concept of you cannot create a mortal danger. Now within that, let's go to the, to the argument made by the NRA and the gun lobby, which is that I need a gun for protection. So in that, in that, uh, in, in the example we brought from, from Babakama, number 17, in fact, the Gemara makes this argument, the Talmud makes the argument, that protection is valid. But what case are they talking about? It says, our rabbis thought no man should breed a dog unless it is kept on a chain. He may have, however, breed in a town adjoining the frontier. Okay? Now, we're not talking about Tucson, Arizona, okay? or San Diego, you know, Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're talking about in the time of the Talmud, and you're living in a frontier town, and the marauders are all around you. So in that case, okay, you, 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 can keep it, you have to keep it chained by day, because they would attack at night, but at night, you can let it free to scare off any potential. So there we have one example that for protection, you're allowed to do it. Now the main source for selling guns and weapons is number 22. It's in Tractate of Odizara, and it deals directly with this question. And it will talk about the protection issue also. One should not sell them either weapons. This is the pagans. We're talking about people who were dangerous, who were not God-fearing, who we had to worry if we turned our back on them, they're going to kill us. So I can't sell them weapons or accessories of weapons. I shouldn't grind any weapon for them. I can't sell them anything, iron chains, neck chains or ropes, anything. Now, some of these are not necessarily weapons. And if you go, if you go to the end of this, almost at the end, said Ravada Barava, you should not sell them bars of iron. A bar, on our bar, we're not worried that he's going to take the bar and slam you in the head. That's not a weapon. But I'm giving them the means. Why? Because they may hammer weapons out of them. So you see to the extent to which we're worried, if we have people who we're assuming are serial killers, rapists, murderers, pagans who go around killing people, so that's for sure, I can't sell a criminal a weapon. Okay, now why can't I sell the criminal the weapon? Two reasons I can't sell the criminal the weapon. The two concepts we just discussed. Concept number one, I can't sell them the weapon, in, in this context, is because... I'm assuming that with that weapon he's going to kill people and he's going to kill other Jews. So just like I can't create a dangerous situation in my own house, I surely am not selling an assault weapon, you know, to a Palestinian who I'm afraid is going to go around, you know, shooting people. So if a criminal walks into my hardware store, okay, and he's still wearing his prison fatigues because he just escaped, it would be very... <laughs> It, it would be absurd for me to sell him an assault weapon because he's probably going to kill me first anyway. But even if he doesn't kill me, okay, he's going to go out and he's going to create mayhem with that. 
So that has, that has to do with the issue of the background searches and so on. But the Gemara here clearly says that I can't sell him something that... So this is to a pagan. But the Gemara doesn't just talk about pagans. Okay, in the middle here it says that uh, the second paragraph, Rabdimi Baraba said, just as it is forbidden to sell to an idolater, so it is forbidden to sell to a robber in Israelite. What are the circumstances? If he's suspected of murder, it's quite plain. If he's a serial killer, he's a murderer, of course I can't sell it to him. What difference does it make? So he is the same as an idolater. If, on the other hand, he never committed murder, so why should I assume, why not sell it to him? See, the idolaters are talking about people who we assumed are going to use these weapons to commit murder. But if I have a Jew and he wants to buy a weapon, why should I assume he should sell it? So it, it refers indeed to one who has not committed murder, but we may be dealing here with a cowardly thief who is apt at times when caught to save himself by committed, committing murder. In other words, he's a two-story man. He'll go into the house. Okay, now most two-story men don't carry weapons because they're, they're, not, they're, they're not hardened criminals. They're not going to defend themselves. Either they'll give up or they'll just run. But he's a guy, he's not going to threaten you. He's not going to kill you. But if you confront him, he's killing you. So I can't, so he's not a murderer in the, in the day-to-day situation. But in his line, in his chosen profession, which is to be a thief, if confronted, he will fight. So I have to worry if I sell him the weapon that in fact, that in fact he, will, he will fight. So here the Gemara ends off, the la- second to last line, said Ravashi, we sell it to the Persians who protect us. So what Ravashi is saying, is living, living on the Persian rule, that if, you, if you're in the business or you have that skill to make weapons, you can sell it to the Persian army. Why can I sell it to the Persian army? Because the Persian army, is, their purpose is not to go out and kill the citizens. It's to protect Persia, you know, against the Greeks or whoever, whatever century, whoever they happen to be fighting at that time. So here again we have an example. You obviously can, you can, you can have a weapon for protection. If you've been to Israel, it's less so now than the first time I was there 40 years ago. But 40 years ago, when you got on a bus in Israel, I mean, half the people were carrying these assault rifles because they were soldiers coming back and coming forth. If you got on on the Lexington Avenue train and you saw a few people carrying assault rifles, you're getting off that train. But in Israel, you can stay, you know, you you don't need to worry that that they're going to attack you. And they have weapons in their house because they are, unfortunately, you know, in, in a constant danger. So we, here it's clear if, if you can sell it to someone who's using to protect you, just as you could keep the dog unchained if you live in a Wild West border town to protect you at night. Okay, now let's go back to the original question. Okay, so I'm a, re- I'm, I'm a retailer and I have a hardware store in the South. They love their guns. That's going to be my biggest, hottest product line. Okay, can I stock guns and sell them? Okay, so the analysis has many different... Let's just go through a few steps of the analysis. First, let's take it as a given that the person doesn't really need it to protect themselves. That that argument, let's assume that that's not, in most cases, not a valid argument. In other words, it's very, I think, very rare that anybody saved themselves from being killed by an intruder, okay, in a house of du- intrusion or whatever it's called, because they were able to whip out, you know, their Sig Hauer or their Glock and shoot the intruders before the intruders got them. So let's assume that the protection argument is not a good protection. Then we go to the second question. Is the person I'm selling this gun to allowed to have a gun? And there the argument would seem to be, for sure he's not allowed to. Because that's there can't be any greater lososim domim vesecha. You know, do not create a situation. A rickety ladder, he fall, he may kill himself, may not kill himself, who told him to go on it, maybe he'll see it's rickety. But, it, but if someone, adult or child, picks up that gun and discharges it accidentally, the, in most cases, the, the, you know, you're calling the funeral parlor. You know, it, it's, it's definitely a case of lososim domim vesecha. 
So now, for me, let's say I say I'm not going to have any guns in my house. But this is commerce. America lives on free enterprise. Why can't I sell him the gun? And that's where we come to the concept of lift naive elosite mitchell, don't put a stumbling block. If he's not allowed to have the gun, in other words, for sure if I'm selling to a Jew, and we accept that he's not allowed to have that gun in his house, I have no right to sell it to him. What about the time of the gun? I mean, as we were saying earlier. That's, uh, that, that, oh, now, so that's if I'm selling it to, 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 to a God-fearing or non-God-fearing non Jew, if we accept that, you, that having a gun is, it falls under all those cases. Now, what about selling it to a, what, and we'll come back even to see if we, uh, to the Jew case in a minute. What about selling it to a non-Jew? So there, there, that really boils down to, if he's a criminal, so that's the case of selling weapons, uh, you know, to the pagan or selling them to the Jewish thief. That person is going to go out and, and kill people. And if you look at the last line in 22, the Mishnah says, one should not sell them beers, lions, or anything which may injure the public. Okay? If you have a lion, I don't care where you're putting him. Someone's going to be, if you have a lion in your house, and a few years ago they had that horrible story in Stanford, uh, where the woman, I think, kept a monkey and attacked the neighbor, and it was just a horrible, horrible story. Now, you can't keep the monkey if he's not domesticated because I can't say I'll take that danger, but I surely can't keep the monkey if the monkey can attack and harm somebody else. So I have to worry if, my, if I will do something which will create a danger to the public. So if I'm selling it to a non-Jew, you, you have to weigh that if, in fact, if you think that that's creating a danger to the public, then obviously you couldn't. If you think he's just going to put it in his gun case, and it's just a question that he may have in his house an accident, then, then you can. But that's, those are the two separate issues. One, I have to worry about that, you know, if the Jew's not allowed to have a gun, then I can't sell it to him because it's lift naiver. The second question is that I can't, if I sell it, if I sell it to someone without the background check, Okay, so there the argument is, I'm creating a danger to the public. And I have no right, whoever I'm selling it to, Jew or non-Jew, the Gemara has both cases, I can't create a danger to the public. Now here we have a fascinating... Uh, have a f now, if you move that one step back, that's the retailer. What about the manufacturer? All those companies in New England that produce... Uh, you know, Colts and Sig Hauer's and all of these produce the guns. They don't sell it to the person himself, they sell it to the retailer. So there also you could have both arguments. You're selling it to the retailer, eventually it's going to be sold to the public, and endangers the public. And as I can't import lions to sell to a retailer who's going to sell them as house pets. Because at the end of the day, I'm creating the danger to the public. And the second thing is, well, which is a more complicated question. If he's selling it to Jews, so the retailer is over Lifneiver. I still can't sell it if I'm the manufacturer because I can't allow the retailer to be, I am putting the Avera of, I am inducing him to do the Avera of Lifneiver. So it goes all the way up the tree, yes. In the case of the manufacturer, yes. isn't, um, so... I think there's a difference between the manufacturer and the retailer. The, manu the retailer is a single sale um, to one individual. Yes. The, the manufacturer is selling to a, to a wholesaler that's distributing to multiple people. So they to retailers. Start, uh, so, uh, the, the, the wholesaler. To, the wholesaler. wholesaler right. The manufacturer is giving to the wholesaler. The wholesaler, wholesaler is giving it to retailers. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. But, 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 correct. but again, the, 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 at the end of the day... When I'm, when I'm sending that Glock or that assault rifle, AK-15, from my plant, I know where is it going to end up. So It's going to end up in somebody's house. Or it may end up, uh, or it may end up in, in uh, if I'm selling it here in New York, it may end up in the middle of, uh, middle that of is nowhere correct. for hunting purposes. So my, 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 my point is that I see 
I see a parallel a between. Uh, hold on, I see a distinction between the 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 sale in for retail and the sale for man, manufacturer or wholesale. Uh, similar, the case in point, I would I would argue, would be the case of the fire temple, where uh, according there was the the, the where our buyer That's a very good said, point. Said that they may be using it for for for. So it depends on percentages according to that. It, it, so I I would argue I. This was an excellent, excellent point that was made, but you could disti you could distinguish even further, okay? In, in the case we know that you see that it, you, there's a concept of pikuach nefesh, right? Concept pikuach nefesh means that I can violate almost any commandment to save someone's life, right? Now th th that pikuach nefesh it doesn't ha even if there's a small probability that the person is in a circumstance that he's going to die, I still can violate the commandment if there is some possibility he's going to die. You could argue the converse or reverse of that. When I'm sending these weapons out, it is true that a lot of them are going to go to New Hampshire, and they're going to go up in a mountain, and they're going to shoot. Now, once in a while, they're going to shoot a person too. But putting that aside, okay, uh, you're saying that some of the people buying it in the store also. Some are buying it for sport, and some are buying it but again, if having that weapon, okay, even if there's a small probability that this hunter is going to have it in his house and his grandchildren are over and he fell asleep and one of them picks up the shotgun and goes over to Grandpa <laughs> and says, Grandpa, I know how to shoot this and there's no more Grandpa. Rabbi, I, I agree. I one source... So well, I'm going to come to that tomorrow in the dorm. Oh, that's going to be okay, critical in a minute. But we didn't. We we one of the sources that we did not discuss here is the fact that there are three cardinal sins, right? So the sin of of murder, adultery, and uh, idolatry. Yes. So I think they're three that they are tied together. So the fact that Abaye, in the case of the fire temple, uh, can say that I can supply the temple with wood because of the potential that they would use it. I hear your point about the fact that percentages may not matter here because we're dealing with the, the, the converse of protecting one's everything, life. Everything you say is excellent, but, but I'm going to come back to that case in a minute. Now, the, we, we said before, so let's assume that you're not allowed to have the gun, and by selling it, I'm in an old Jewish town, and am I allowed to sell the guns? And assuming people are not, that, are not selling it. On the other hand, my hardware store is on Main Street, and if you go a mile out of town, there's the world's biggest Walmart. And Walmart, not that they don't make enough tens of billions, they still like to sell, uh, are, sell guns and proud to sell guns because that's the constituency that they have. So the question here is the fact that if I don't sell him the gun, Walmart will sell him the gun. <coughs> So I'm not endangering the public. He wants a gun. My telling him I'm not selling him the gun is not going to stop him from going to Walmart and getting the gun. So that that's so the argument is that that's the equivalent of the fundamental Gemara that we had with, with the person who is a Nazir. The Nazir is saying, "Give me the cup of wine." Now, if the cup of wine is on the same table as, as the Nazir and the other person. You're not doing anything because he can get the cup of wine anyway. If Walmart's across the street from me, if I don't sell him the gun, he's going across the street, he's going to Walmart, they're selling him, they're selling him the gun. So does that mean I'm allowed to sell him, I'm allowed to sell him, I'm allowed to sell him the gun? So here, this is a, uh, this, this is a major argument. If you look in Code of Jewish Laws, and there, the Ramah, one of the two codifiers of the law there, he brings two possibilities. One who says that he's not talking about, he's not talking about selling weapons, he's talking about the Gemara and the Durham, selling to a pagan house of worship. Am I allowed to sell to a pagan house of worship something that they could buy someplace else? So he says that some say you're allowed to, and then some say, because it's the same as being on the same side of the river, he can get it whether I supply it or not. And some say, you're not allowed to. And then if you look on the side, in the interpreters, some say that there's a difference if I'm selling to a Jew or selling to a non-Jew. 
if I'm selling to a non-Jew, okay, then if he can get it someplace else, he can get it someplace else, there's no problem. If I'm selling to a Jew, then there would be a rabbinic injunction that I'm not allowed to, even if it's not lifnaiver, because he could get it someplace else, I'm somehow participating, encouraging him. It's like the case of buying the, uh, buying, uh, the stolen item. Now, he's already, he's already uh, done the uh, deed. He already stole it. But the Maimonides said, I can't buy the stolen item because I'm encouraging him to steal. So the same thing, when, I, when I'm participating with somebody in doing a sin, so even though it's not Lifne Iver, because he could have gotten it uh, someplace else, but I'm still not, so it doesn't violate the Torah's principle of do not put a stumbling block. However, it does violate a rabbinic principle that even though it's not a stumbling block because he was going to do it anyway, I still can't participate. I'm encouraging him somehow. I can't participate in that sin. Now, the Vilna Gon, who was uh, one of the great, uh, he, he obviously was from Vilna, and he, he, he was one of the great Talmudic geniuses of all time, he says that it's absolutely incorrect. And he brings a very simple uh, proof. He says the Gemara, the Gemara that you've been quoting with Ravashi, Ravashi owned the forest. So if, we, if you t take a look, look back at that case, which was number four. four. Okay, Ravashi owned the forest, which he sold to a fire temple. Said Ravina to Ravashi, but there is the injunction, shall not put a stumbling block. In other words, they may use it to, to, do, to, to sacrifice to their god, to their fire god. So he, he replied, Ravashi, the great Talmudist, replied, most wood is used for ordinary heating. And as when he bought this forest, I'm assuming he's using it because it's cold there. I don't have to assume if I, that he's using it to sacrifice to his fire god. So says the Vilna Gon, it's very unlikely that Ravashi's forest was the only place in Babylonia that you could get wood. There definitely were other people who had forests and had wood for sale. So why did the Gemara have to say that, you know, you, Ravashi is allowed to sell wood to the pagan temple because we can assume they're using it for heating purposes rather than to sacrifice to their fire god? Why doesn't the Gemara say that if Ravashi didn't sell it to the temple, right? And believe me, they weren't looking to make money for the Jews. The pagan temple, it's not like they were trying to enrich Ravashi. Would have been happy if there was no Ravashi. So why doesn't the Gemara say that Ravashi was allowed to sell it? Because if they don't buy it from Ravashi, they're going to go across the street and buy it. So it seems to be an incontrovertible proof, though I'm sure the, those who argue on this you know, somehow answer it, that the fact that someone can go across the street and buy from Walmart... If the person is not allowed to have a gun, okay, and it's lift naive for me to give him a gun in his house. Let's take the case where nobody could argue. I, I, you know, someone comes in and wants to buy a lion from me, and he can go across the street and buy the lion. Okay? Now, there's no possible reason that a person would be allowed to own a lion, unless he's a zoo. But if it's not a zoo, you can't have a lion in your house. Would anybody say that I can sell him the lion because that's exactly the question here. I can sell him the lion. Let me make the money. Walmart is rich enough. So why should I allow him to, to walk out of my store? But we see here that that doesn't work. In other words, if I'm not allowed to sell it to him, the fact that, that he can go across the street and get the lion doesn't help me. And that's what the issue that you raised earlier which is that the Mishnah Mel talks about. In other words, that someone, I lend money at usury. And I'm on a street in, in New York City. In the old days, there would have been a street in the little town where all the money lenders sat. And a Jew comes in and wants to borrow money from me at usurious rates. So obviously, I'm not allowed to lend him the money anyway because that, you're not allowed to lend money at usury. But is there a problem of putting a stumbling block in front of him? 
So that so so there also Mishlam El says the same argument that the fact that he could go to somebody else doesn't make a difference. It's still lifneiver if I if I do it. So how do we from, from, from a rabbinic from a rabbinic standpoint or from a, from a uh, no the rice standpoint. I'm not allowed to. Well, there it's different. That's where the other lender would be a Jew. Okay. If the other lender. Rabbi, so how do we reconcile that with the, with the Nazir situation, with the cups of wine? No, because the Nazir, no, in the Nazir situation, right, the, he can't get it. He can get it? No, in those, if it's here, I'm not doing anything. It's his wine. So maybe I'm doing him a favor by moving it closer to him to save him, you know, the, the tirch of getting up and getting it. But it's his wine, and, you know, he's asking me to give it to me. If I don't give it to him, he's taking it anyway. But if I'm on the other side of the river, the fact that there is someone else willing to give him that wine, that's not going to get me, that's not going to get me out of it. So I'm going to wrap up now. So ba basically, the, uh, just to go back what I said before, the lift naive 30 seconds. The lift naive is a concept, it applies to the case of the mortgage brokers, the whole financial collapse. Many things that are done on Wall Street are cases, for sure, of lift naive, where they, they deceive people and, you know, caveat emperor, they let the buyer beware. But you can't do that because that's lift naive. And the fact that he wants the gun, so that's, he's an ever. He's blind. I have no right to uh, sell it to him. The question of protection, so we saw there, you could keep the dog unchained at night on a frontier town. You know, you can sell to the Persian army, but if that would allow you to, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not here to give you the law, but to say that having a gun in your house in New York City is ever going to protect you from anything, that's uh, most unlikely. Great, thank you very much.